start. Okay, so it will be connected on this uh, slide. So I have the great great pleasure to introduce uh, to you today uh, Barak Rotblad. So I met Barak uh, more recently in Bersheva at BGU, and it's quite nice. We had a so a nice chat, and then I thought it would be interesting to invite him because he's doing a quite quite interesting work in which we are also interested in, especially also related to brain tumors. So uh, Barak has done his, M, uh, his MCS, Master of Science at Tel Aviv University in the Department of Plant Science. So he was studying the plant defense response. Then he did a PhD at Tel Aviv University in neurochemistry, and he was studying the RAS oncogene. Then he did a postdoc in UBC in Vancouver in Canada, studying the role of ubiquitin E3 ligase in Huntington's disease. And then a second postdoc at the MRC a toxicology unit in Leicester, UK, where he studied uh, P73. So as a member of the P53 family and it, its role in re regulating mRNA translation. And since 2014, he has been recruited at BGU where he got a very uh, good offer that he could not refuse, he told me. Uh, uh, we studied the role of non-coding mRNA translation and uh, a mitochondrial chaperone in cancer. So his work is uh, important in, in some uh, respect. That means that the cancer cells, they upregulate the expression and activity of negative regulators of mRNA translation. And these events support the adaptation of these cells to nutrient deprivation. And he and his group, they have uh, so investigated the hypothesis, and I think they proved the hypothesis that their endogenous inhibitors of mRNA translation that are supporting the adaptive process inside of the tumor. And this could constitute new drug targets for the future, so uh, so so I think it's a, it's extremely interesting, interesting topic, especially also to brain tumors. But I think he's more interested in childhood brain tumors. That uh, what what he told me. But he has also I, I think some work on some lines, uh, so so glioblastoma cell lines and so forth in so so in mind. So with this, I will uh, stop my introduction and I give the floor to Barak now. Thank you, Andreas, uh, for the invitation. And uh, indeed, I, this is one of the things I love about science. You get to meet interesting uh, people doing cool stuff and uh, and connect. So thank you for the invitation. And um, yes, so, so this slide is, is I'm, I'm from Ben Gurion University in the Negev. The Negev is the, in the desert in Israel. And this is a picture uh, 40 minutes drive from where we are at. And my kids and, and the dog, we're, we're, we went for a hike. So it's beautiful there. And um, well, what, what we're interested in is, is what endogenous pathways do tumor cells exploit uh, to their own advantage. And, and we hypothesize that Tumor cells, they, so they, they take advantage of pathways which have evolved to help cells deal with stress. And the tumor cells, by definition, they're under stress, and, and then they would exploit these pathways. And if this is indeed the case, then these pathways from a drug, drug targeting view, um, because uh, normal, the normal tissue is not under so much stress as the tumor tissue, and therefore, it is, it is predicted that the tumor tissue would suffer more from inhibiting such pathways. So <clears throat> th this, is, this is the vesiculature of, uh, this is a scheme of the vesiculature of normal tumor uh, tissue and the tumor tissue. And because the vesiculature and the tumor tissue is defective, and this is, of course, uh, dealing with uh, solid tumors, including uh, brain tumors, and then the, there is a gradient uh, of, of stress or of lack of nutrients and oxygen uh, that is, is occurring from the cells which are just touching the, the blood vessels uh, into the tissue. And, <clears throat> and, and, and we, 
we were wondering how, how a cell will deal with such stress. And, and let's start with how a cell deals with any kind of stress. So let's, let's imagine we have here a cell and it has two pathways, enzymes catalyzing some pathways to generate some metabolite. And then there's some stress, let's say oxidative stress and the, the antioxidants are consumed. So what can the cell do? It can upregulate the expression of the enzymes making these metabolites so the cell can compensate and make more of this metabolite. So this is, this is basically what it means in a molecular sense adaptation. This is, uh, the, this is a, a one of the, of the definitions. And we think about what the cell has to do in order to adapt, then it has to increase the expression of some enzymes. But what happens under stress, and this is under almost any kind of stress in the cell, is the cell stops making new proteins. This is quite universal. We see it with the ER stress response, but we see it with many, many other stresses, including heat shock, that the cell stops making new proteins, except making a selected few. So the cell, uh, and, and this process is called the selective translation. And, and basically what the cell does, it decides, it has a pool of mRNAs and it decides which mRNA will actually become translated in the polysome and which mRNA will not. And this is regulated by proteins. Now, we, if we go back to our, our cancer question, um, then we believe that for the tumor cells to adapt, it also needs to inhibit protein synthesis under stress. And protein synthesis is the most ATP consuming cellular process. And we've, if we're discussing metabolic stress, then it's quite obvious that it would need to stop making new proteins. And, and here's a, a bit of a dilemma for the tumor cells, because on the one hand, tumor cells make, wants to make a lot of proteins. And we know that pro-oncogenic pathways such as mTOR are hyperactive in in, in tumor cells and, and they push for, for increased protein synthesis. On the other hand, the tumor cells need to adapt and needs to survive stress. So I think it is, it is naive to think that inhibitors of protein synthesis are tumor suppressors because they reduce the amount of proteins made, reducing the pace or the, the, the rate by which a cell grows. So on the one hand, one can think that they might be tumor suppressors and actually that's the general consensus, let's say in the field, that in general, the pathways and proteins which inhibit protein synthesis are, are, are let's say, have a more tumor suppressor function. But we argue that this is not the case and actually tumor cells very much rely on these translation inhibitors for their adaptation and survival. So this is the basic idea and let's see um, the model. So, <clears throat> so let's see, how does the cell know assuming that the cell knows something, how does the cell know that it has now, uh, that it's under metabolic stress? Well, it has molecular sensors. So here are two famous sensors, AMP kinase and mTOR. And we know that AMP kinase senses the amount of, of energy in the cell by directly, by having binding pockets to nucleotides. So it has binding pockets that it can bind ATP, ADP, and AMP. And through the binding and the stoichiometry of the binding, it, it, it changes its, its signaling, uh, and if ATP levels drop and AMP, ADP levels go up, so this is energetic stress, AMPK becomes active and, and basically phosphorylates downstream uh, uh, targets. Now, we know that under glucose starvation, ATP level, AMPK becomes active, and actually it's essential for cells to have an active AMPK because otherwise they can't adapt to glucose starvation and they die of oxidative stress. So this pathway has figured out, we know how AMPK senses glucose starvation, and you know what happens downstream of AMPK to survive glucose starvation. Another famous uh, uh, protein or energy sensor is mTOR. And we know now how mTOR senses glucose starvation. And actually there's, in the past uh, three years, there's been three major papers showing different ways by which mTOR knows what's the, the, that there is glucose starvation. And we know that mTOR inhibition is essential for cells to survive glucose starvation. So if you have cells with hyperactive mTOR, for example, TSC2 knockouts, then, then they, they're hypersensitive to glucose starvation. But we don't know what happens downstream of mTOR inhibition in order for cells to survive glucose starvation. 
And we thought this is interesting because mTOR controls the protein synthesis and downstream of mTOR inhibition is inhibition of protein synthesis. So we thought this is interesting. And this is the question where we, we, we hope to, to answer in our project. <clears throat> so what do we know? We know that mTOR inhibition is essential for cells to survive glucose starvation. And we know that in general, it is thought that mTOR inhibition leads to reduced protein synthesis, reduced cell growth, and increased cell survival under glucose starvation. And we also know that mTOR inhibition leads to, uh, to increased uh, autophagy, reduced translation, increased ATP levels, and survival. So this we know, but these schemes and errors actually have not been rigorously proven. And, and this is what we try to do in this project is to really see um, how, how this works, what happens downstream of mTOR. So we know what happens downstream of NPK. So this has been figured out and basically uh, we have a fatty acid synthesis, which is the most NADPH consuming cellular pathway. And when nutrients drop, AMPK uh, is, becomes active phosphorylating ACC, which is a rate limiting enzyme in fatty acid synthesis, inhibiting fatty acid synthesis, allowing the cells to conserve NADPH and survive uh, glucose starvation. So, so this AMPK has been figured out. But what about mTOR? Well, we don't know. So this is, this is a simplified scheme of the, of the mTOR signaling pathways. And, and the take home message uh, from, from this is that mTOR controls many, many things. We, need, we know that mTOR needs to be blocked for cells to survive glucose starvation, but we don't know what happens downstream of mTOR inhibition to help the cell survive. And as, as, you can, as you can see, many things can explain this. So what we did was we took MPK knockout cells, which are hypersensitive to glucose starvation, and we treated them with glucose starvation, collected the cells, and used the PI and fax in order to measure cell death. So all, all the experiments I will show you regarding cell death is the same, it's the same procedure. And the stats is basically each experiment was done with three biological replicates three times, and the three dots represents three dependent experiments. So this is the death in the control cells, and this is the death in the cells, MPK knockouts treated with glucose starvation, nothing new here. Now, we put an mTOR inhibitor. Assuming that mTOR inhibition is essential to survive glucose starvation, we use rapamycin, and we see that it doesn't really change anything. And this is nice to see, not because we don't think mTOR is important, but because this actually has been published in the paper showing that the MPK is important for survival of the glucose starvation. They put up a mice, nothing happened, and therefore they concluded that mTOR is not important. Mm -hmm. However, we used also another mTOR inhibitor, which is called KU, and we did see that there's a, a significant rescue of cell death. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at what rapamycin does and what KU does, and how it affects mTOR and its, uh, and its pathways towards M and its regulation of mRNA tra translation, then we see that mTOR has two arms by which it regulates mRNA translation, S6 kinase and 4-BP. Now, when mTOR is inhibited by rapamycin, S6 kinase is inhibited. However, 4-BP does not really change. So rapamycin does not affect the 4-BP arm of mTOR. However, KU does affect both arms. So we concluded from this experiment that there is, that there is, we hypothesized from this experiment that the 4DP arm is essential for cells to survive glucose starvation, <coughs> for cells to survive glucose starvation. Now we repeated, the, we repeated this experiment in another AMPK deficient cell line, which is HILA. They have a, a, a mutation in the tumor suppressor LKD and basically, APK does, cannot sense glucose starvation in these cells. And we see that they die of glucose starvation. Rapamycin does not save them, but KU or cyclohexamide, which blocks mRNA translation, do rescue. So what is 4-BP? So under high energy conditions, so mTOR is active, and it phosphorylates 4-BP, and 4-BP is inactive. In this case, EIF4E can bind the cap of mRNA, recruit EIF4G and A, and there is mRNA translation. 
when energy is low. For EP loses its phosphorylation because mTOR is no longer active kinase. Binding for E, competing with GNA on the for E, and then there's reduced translation. So through 4-ABP, by phosphorylating 4-ABP, mTOR promotes translation. And when 4-ABP loses its phosphorylation, then it becomes active to inhibit protein synthesis. So is 4-ABP important? So we used MEFs, which have which are wild type or knockout of 4-ABP. And we did the same experiment, this time with glucose starvation or amino acid starvation. And to make the long story short, under glucose starvation, the wild type MEFs, they, they're fine, but for P knockouts, they die. Same, same story we used with a very similar model, this time with HEC-293s, and it's the same story. Control cells uh, survive, and knockdown, 4 p knockdown cells, they die. But can 4 p rescue? Is this direct? So we overexpress the hyperactive 4 p in HeLa cells, which I would remind you are hypersensitive to glucose starvation. We put them under glucose starvation and the control cells, they die. The overexpressing cells, they protect it. So we conclude from here that at least in, in human and mouse cells, 4 p protects against glucose starvation. We did it with a, in a bunch of other cell lines, which you can look at the list here, but basically we, we had the same results. So in many, many cell lines, including IPCs, for example, if you knock down 4 p the cell line becomes uh, uh, more, more susceptible to glucose starvation. Now you're probably wondering, is this conserved in evolution? So apparently yeast have a 4 p uh, paralogs, which are called CAF20 and EAP. So we took the wild type and the mutants and the single mutants, double mutants, and put them under glucose starvation. And as you can see, the, calf, the wild type and CAF20 no, mutant cells, they, they're fine, but the EAP cells, yeast, they can grow under the glucose starvation. Also, if we grow them in suspension and we take a sample of yeast and we plate them, then we can see the wild type cells they survive glucose starvation, but the EAP cells much less. So this pathway or this function of EAP is conserved in evolution. But does this have anything to do with protein synthesis? So we did the experiment and the, to make the long story short, we put the cell with the synthetic amino acids, which we can, we can detect by blood. And the more it's incorporated into proteins, the more black, we have on the blood. So we can measure protein synthesis by measuring how much signal there is in the blood. And we can see that in controlled conditions, there is more synthesis. And then when glucose starve for three or 24 hours, protein synthesis go down. But this is also the case in the 4 knockout cells. And, and this is exactly what our, our, uh, our reaction was. Our reaction is myself and Gabriele Provier, which is a partner uh, a collaborator and an equal partner in this project and his group, him and his group. And we were wondering what, because our model was very clear for BP, blocks protein synthesis, and this is how cells, they preserve ATP and they survive glucose starvation, but this is not the case. So what is the case? So we contacted our friend, Sarah Maria Pent, and she's a cancer metabolism expert, and we sent her cells, um, uh, control and knockdown cells with and without glucose starvation to do some metabolomics analysis. And actually there was no big difference in ATP under glucose starvation, but the big difference that, that uh, she did observe was the ratio between NADP plus and NADPH was really affected in the 4 knockdown cells, but not so much in the wild type cells. And this will confirm with uh, uh, specific uh, individual assays in, in Excel. So NADPH is the most, I wouldn't say the most because who knows, but one of the most important uh, to, uh, antioxidants in the cell. And basically what this result says is, or a prediction from this result is the cells will become, uh, will have less antioxidants when they start for glucose. So we measured ROS, reactive oxygen species, and we can see there's no big difference under control condition, but when you glucose starve the MEFs or the HEX, you see increase in ROS. And in HeLa cells, when you have overexpression of 4 and you glucose starve them, then there's a decrease in ROS. So 4 
reduces loss in the cells. But is this how it promotes survival? So we took the 4-LP knockouts and we treated them with antioxidants because if they die because of oxidative stress then all antioxidants should reduce the cell death. And this is exactly what we got. So this is the control cells treated with glucose starvation. And when we treated them with NACO or catalase, two antioxidants, MEFs or HEX, then we see a rescue cell death. So 4 v protect cells against glucose starvation by reducing ROS. But the question is, how does it do it? So 4 p controls translation, but it is uh, also known to control selective translation. So it affects the, the synthesis of some mRNAs more than others. So we ask which proteins are more highly expressed in the knockdown versus the control cells under glucose starvation to give us a clue to what might 4 p be doing. So in the proteomic analysis, we found ACC1, which is the, so ACC1 is part of the fatty acid synthesis pathway, and, it, uh, and, and it's predicted that it, if it's more expressed, there will be more fatty acid synthesis, more consumption of NADPH. And this is in agreement with the ROS data that we have. So we, we probed, uh, we did some blots for the uh, fatty acid synthesis pathway, and we have here the cells either control cells or knockdown cells at time zero, six hours, 16 or 24 hours post-glucose starvation. And look at ACC1. So under normal condition, actually there's more in the control versus knockdown cells. Under six hours, it's already equalized. Under 16 hours, which is the same time we did this experiment, you see there's already more in the knockdown cells versus the control. So this validates our proteomics. Basically there's more ACC1 in the knockdown cells when you glucose starve them. Now, ACC controls glucose starvation. <clears throat> yeah, so ACC controls uh, fatty acid synthesis. So is there more fatty acid synthesis in the 4 d knockdown cells? So we pulse the cells with a labeled acetate and we follow the carbons into the lipid fraction to measure the flux to fatty acids. <clears throat> and, and what we found was that under uh, glucose starvation, the wild type cells actually fatty acid synthesis is decreased, which makes sense, right? When we have less glucose in our body, we make less fat. And when we have, when we eat a lot of sugar and so on, we make more fat. So this is exactly the same in the cells. But the 4 knockdown, they have actually more fatty acid synthesis. And this is even more pronounced in the meth cells, where in the wild type, they, they bring down fatty acid synthesis when you starve them, but the knockout cells, they actually increase. Now in the cell, there's all the time a balance between fatty acid synthesis and fatty acid oxidation. And the prediction would be that fatty acid synthesis would go up and fatty acid oxidation would go down. And this is, a, this is the case. So we took a labeled palmitate and we can follow the hydrogens into the water. So this is basically when the cell burns palmitate, that's what happens, hydrogens move into the water. And we can see that there's no big difference under normal condition, but when you glucose starve, look at the 16 hours, for example, there is decreased fatty acid oxidation in the, in the 4 p knockout cells versus the control. And this is in the 293, and in the, in the NEFs, it's the same story. So more fatty acid synthesis and less fatty acid oxidation in the 4 p knockout cells under glucose starvation. Now, is this the reason why these cells die? You're probably asking. So we took the knockout cells, we starved them for glucose, and they die, of course. Now we added an inhibitor of fatty acid synthesis, and we see a rescue of cell death. And this is also we did with, let's say, more genetic model where we knock down specifically ACC1, and we also see a rescue of cell death under glucose starvation when we knock down ACC1. Now, is ACC1 really regulated at the level of translation? And uh, to do this, we measure translation efficiency, which is uh, the, the basically asking the question, how much mRNA is there in the cell? And how much is there in the polysomal fraction? Or in other words, is ACC, does the cell want to make more protein of the whatever of ACC, or does it want to make less protein? And what we see here is under normal conditions, there's no big difference if you have if cells have or do not have 4 dp But under glucose starvation, the translation of ACC goes really up in the 4 dp knockdown cells. We follow this up with a transfection experiment. And we asked 
because translation regulation is often encoded in the five prime UTR the transcript. <clears throat> so we transfected a construct of ACC, HA tagged ACC with the five prime UTR or without. And we treated the cells with glucose starvation. And what we saw is that when there is the five prime UTR, translation really goes up in the, in the faulty knockout cells under glucose starvation. So this is control and this is knockout. But if it does not have the five prime UTR, there's actually no difference. So f regulates the translation of ACC1 under glucose starvation, and this regulation is encoded in the five prime UTR of ACC1. So now we have a model where <clears throat> in case of NPK, we know that there's a regulation of ACC reduced NADPH and uh, reduced ROS. And now we can say about 4DP that under glucose starvation, uh, 4DP binds to 4E, regulating the translation of ACC, reducing fatty acid synthesis, reducing NADPH consumption, reducing ROS, and leading to survival of the cell. So basically, we have now two independent mechanisms by which the cell controls fatty acid synthesis through ACC. One, we have APK phosphorylating ACC. And two, we have 4 dp preventing the translation, the synthesis of ACC. So we have why is there two options? Um, so I don't know, but I'm imagining or I'm hypothesizing that this is very similar to what uh, Kandel found with the experiments in Neplesia in, in the 70s, where he found that long-term memory in slow snail is encoded by protein synthesis, and short-term memory is encoded by phosphorylation. So one can, can hypothesize that NPK phosphorylating ACC bring down its its uh, activity by 70% is the first step where what the cell does once uh, there's glucose starvation. And then for the long-term more adaptive uh, process, then you have ODP preventing the synthesis of more uh, ACC1. But uh, you are all interested in cancer and not only you. And you're probably wa wondering, so what about cancer? <laughs> so here we go. So first we used uh, just uh, very general uh, uh, trans transformation models, uh, uh, cancer models. So we used NT2197, which we got from Ivan Topirovich, which is, uh, is a 4DP expert in McGill. And what he did was he took uh, uh, mammary epithelial cells from, uh, from uh, mice and he transformed them with HER2, which is a uh, and oncogene. And he used mice, either wild type mice or 4 VP knockout mice. So we have a very nice transformation model with the same oncogene of two cell lines per mouse that were transformed. Now we inject this into non skid mice and we get tumors, but we get much less tumors with the 4 VP knockout cells. So this is just a transformation model, not a human cancer. <clears throat> now, According to our model, the reason why these are small is because they have too much ACC and they can't really adapt to the glucose starvation in their uh, microenvironment. So we took these cells and we knocked down ACC and we repeated the experiment. But this time we find a rescue. So indeed, also in this mammary epithelial cell model transformed with an oncogene, we see that 4DP promotes tumorigenicity and it does so by regulating ACC1 expression. And we took the HeLa cells, the same ones that we showed the in vitro data, and we injected them into the mouse. And we could see that overexpression of a hyperactive 4DP, they generate bigger tumors. So we can say that 4DP promotes tumor genicity, and it does so by regulating ACC1. But I don't have to explain to this crowd the, the importance of clinical relevance. And apparently 4DP1 is, in, is clinically relevant in many cancers. We were very much interested in glioma. And the reason is that uh, uh, the, the intrastitial uh, fluid in the brain is very uh, 
deprived of glucose. Every glucose molecule passes by, there is some cell in the brain which grabs it and uses it. So this is a condition where the tumor has to grow and adapt to low glucose environment. So this is a clinical data and the expression of 4-ODP is correlated with poor uh, prognosis in glioma tumors and specifically also in glioblastoma tumors. Ah. Um, and, and regarding ACC, so there's uh, two papers that came out quite recently, which did proteomic analysis on uh, glioblastoma tumors. And we find that there is an inverse correlation between 4DP levels and ACC levels at the protein level, which is what you expect if our model, mo model is true. So more 4DP, less ACC. So uh, <clears throat> we took GL261, which is a mouse glioma model, and we injected it into mice, black six mice, so they have an immune system. And we follow the survival of the mice, and we can see that the knockdown, 4DP knockdown, uh, uh, Mice inoculated with faulty knockdown glioma cells, they survive more than the control mice. And if we take these cells and now uh, knock down ACC in these cells, we see that there's a rescue of the phenotype. So we can conclude that 4DP uh, is important for uh, development of, of brain tumors and that it does so by regulating the synthesis of ACC1. But is 4DP a target? Obviously, patients don't come into the clinic uh, before the tumor is developing in, the, in their tissue. So we ask, what happens when there is already a developed tumor? <clears throat> so we did a subcute experiment with U87 cells. So they inject, we injected the cells to the flank. We let them grow little tumors that you can see with your eyes. And then we hit this with the mice with doxycycline and the drinking water, water which act activates 4B knockdown uh, in, the, in, the, in these mice, in the tumors of these mice. So while all our controls, so they have a scrambled SH or they were not given docs and so on, all our control tumors, they grew. Actually, when you knock down 4DP, there's shrinkage of the, of the tumors. So we think that 4DP is a, is a drug target. So I would like to conclude by thanking our collaborator, uh, Gabriele Proviez, a friend of mine from the postdoc. Uh, we, we were working bench to bench together. And until today, we're very good friends. He has a group in Germany, in uh, Düsseldorf. And his PhD student, Kai and Laura, they did a big part of the, of the work that I uh, showed. And of course, I'd like to thank my group. So especially uh, Tal Devi, who did the radioactive and animal experiments, and Khaul El Assad, that she did all the translation experiments, <laughs> polysomes, and so on. And I'd like to thank our funders, and of course, thank you, Andreas, for the kind invitation to present. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so thank you very much for this very, very interesting talk. Maybe we should. We can put off the slide from this so that we see you now more. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So we can, you, you uh, will take off the slide. Is it possible? From sharing? Yes, from sharing that we see. That we see. I'll, I'll okay. Stop sharing. okay, stop sharing. Okay, that's, that's perfect. Okay, so thank you very much. I mean, uh, so I don't know if there's uh, if there are any students in the audience here. So if there are any students, it is a clear example how a scientific uh, uh, research should should be conducted. Okay, you uh, you ask questions, you make hypotheses, and then you you test these hypotheses. Either re you reject them or you. You uh, find find arguments for the other, but you 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 need to do both. And here, this is a very good example, step by step, question hypothesis question. So so hypothesis and test, hypothesis test, hypothesis test, hypothesis test. And uh, and this is I think if there are any students in the audience, they they uh, should uh, really take this as an example how how to do. 
the research project. Okay, so this is for the general uh, general uh, comment on your presentation, which was uh, very clear and very nice. So now, uh, are there any questions in the in the audience? I will. So maybe I can. You can. Uh, you can ask them directly because there are not so many people. Thirty-three. It would be nice if you could ask them. So, so ask them directly. Please unmute your if you want to ask a question. That would be nice. Uh, let's see who is there. Uh, okay, uh, people are a little bit shy. I think. Uh -huh. I mean, if you don't want to ask directly, then you can write it in the chat and I can ask. Uh, so, hello, I, uh, so I, I have a question. Sorry, I, uh, this is Ahmed uh, Sharonik. I'm a postdoctoral fellow with uh, with Andreas Pickfeldy. Sorry, my microphone is, uh, is off, so I'm talking from Audrey. So uh, thank you very much for this presentation. And uh, so We cannot very... see you. Can you? Uh... Uh, sure, yeah. I just... Uh... That he know he sees who you my face here. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. here I am. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi. Nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so I do have a question. If if I understood well from your model, like so under glucose starvation, the cells they reduce the fatty acid synthesis uh, for, to survive. So my question: What uh, what alternative pathway? these cells use for the energy demand i mean for for to, to rewire this energy because the, the glucose is not the glycolysis is not working there and the lipid uh, i mean is not working for you i think and so what is the alternative pathway do you think that these cells um adopt to rewire their energy okay so, so this is a really good question thank you for the question and uh, obviously we we have been thinking about it so the, the short answer is, I don't know, but there are some clues. And uh, what are our thoughts is that one, there's gluconeogenesis. So uh, the cells can, can make new glucose. And the, fact, and the fact that there's increased fatty acid oxidation, then we think that instead of burning sugar, the cell switches to burn fat. Of course, this is sustainable for so long. Yes, it's, it's I mean, at the, at, at one point, the cells will consume all its fat. But assuming that in a, in a physiological scenario, uh, there will be times when the, when the tissue, the tumor tissue will get energy, it will, the, the energy, the, the blood comes in pulses, and there will be times that it cannot, then I think that this can explain it. Um, but another uh, explanation, there's now an increased um, increased interest in, in how the cells uh, uptake proteins from their environment mm. by pinotizitosis and so on. And, and the mTOR pathway has been shown, also us actually, has been shown to directly regulate this process. So another option is that the cell drinks up um, um, proteins from the environment and takes them to the lysosome, breaks them down and uses the amino acids to make energy. And also there is uh, interest in lactate. So the, there's a lot of lactate in the tumor environment. And now the, there is the increased evidence that the cells can actually exploit lactate to make energy. So I, so the short, thing, the short answer was, I don't know, but the long answer mm -hmm. is that there are few options. And I don't know actually in, in our case, the specific uh, pathways which the cells choose, chose to survive. Okay, thanks. So maybe it's uh, also a role of the A, A, the of the EBP in the in inducing these alternative pathways for for the survival. So that's true. I mean, they protect from ROS, but they they also may play a role in inducing another alternative pathways for the energy. So, I mean, it's still uh -oh. hypothesis, but uh, it could be. It could be, and we're also very interested. Like, if if you were. Um... If you're a metabolism aficionado and you look at, our, at the slide I quickly skirted through where there's the proteomic data where we identified ACC1. So there's another protein which actually is very interesting. So ACC1 is increased and it's consuming more, uh, more glucose. It's consuming an ADPH, but also there is a, a decrease in G6PD, which actually produces an ADPH. Yeah. And it could be, and I don't know, but it could be that actually POMP somehow promotes the synthesis of G6PD 
in parallel. And, and when you don't have 4-ABP, then the cell cannot induce G6PD and cannot make an NDPH through the, the, <clears throat> this pathway. And, and this can also explain. So I, I don't think we have 100% of the, of the picture. And I 100% agree with you that we don't have 100% of the picture. But we have a nice picture, I think. <laughs> yeah, let's go. OK, thank you very much. Okay, so is, is there any other questions in in the audience? Can I make um, can I yes. make a comment? Yeah. I am an professor emeritus in the University of Bordeaux. Thank you for your talk. Very interesting talk. And uh, my my comment is on uh, NADPA and uh, fatty acid synthesis. Uh, we we did a lot of uh, model of metabolism uh, in cancer cell and in mitochondrial diseases. And what we observe is that, uh, sorry, I, I think I have an echo. Do you, do you, do you, do you hear me properly? It's not so good. You, you should speak a little bit louder, I think, would be better. Uh, and uh, what we observe is that the problem of uh, proliferating cell is not uh, ATP synthesis, but uh, to be rid of uh, NADH. And uh, we have accumulation of NADH and a way to uh, uh, discard the excess of NADH is to make NADH and to, to transfer NADH and NADPH and to make fatty acid. So this fatty acid appears as a way to escape the great amount of uh, NADH. So I'm not surprised that uh, in your model, you just decrease the, the, the synthesis of, of fatty acid, but you, you usually making ATP is not big problem for for the cells and and it is what we observe in some uh, cases of um, uh, some cases of mitochondrial disease oh we don't hear you anymore hello we don't hear you Sorry. So yeah, we, we heard it, we heard you until the part of mitochondrial disease. So I'm not, can you finish your. I'm your not, uh, you don't hear anything anymore. No, I so. finished. So I think it's finished. Okay, good. So so let's let's go for for another question. Is there anyone else uh, having uh, having a have, having a question? So in the audience here, uh, well, so maybe then I can I can continue a little bit. So, but just again, so you have an increase in the fatty acid synthesis with your knockout, decrease in the oxidation. But did you uh, did you do a time cost? Because maybe it will fluctuate. It will go up. And then go down because you need a synthesis. You need some, at some at some time window. You need an increase in the fatty acid and then the oxidation to so to get energy. So have you have you checked if there's a, is there's kind of wave like behavior or not in the in so 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 in that. So so uh, it's it's a good point. Uh, we we went up to the twenty four hour time point because after. At, at, when you get closer to 48, there's there's a lot of cell death in the knockout cells, and we don't want to measure, you know, cell death. It's it always confounds experiments. But until 24 hours, we see the same thing. So we see uh, <clears throat> decreased fatty acid synthesis, or depends in, in which is cell line you look. But in the knockout cells, we see increased fatty acid synthesis and decre decreased oxidation. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it could be. I mean, I don't know in vivo or in in in, in another scenario uh, whether this is the case. And also, uh, the fatty acid synthesis inhibitor it rescues, and this goes up to forty eight hours. 
Okay. Okay. And uh, and the other uh, other question. So what is so did you check the ER stress response also? What is going on with the ER stress response here? So have so you this, any changes uh, in the ER stress response? This is an excellent question. I suspect that ER stress go up, but I couldn't convince my students to do the experiments yet. <laughs> yeah, but what, mm -hmm. so what would be very interesting to do an IRE1 knockout and then to do a with your cells the so the experiment in changing the 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 e2f uh, for 4e uh, so yeah. the 4 4 ep uh, ebp so changing that in a knock knockout conditions in the the ia1 or in the atf i don't know also so, so what, what for us is uh, i mean because there's the question of <clears throat> of the decreased translation that we see in all cases Right, the knockout yeah. cells they can block translation, and I suspect I don't know, but I suspect that it's through ER stress because it starves the cells for glucose. It has been shown that there's defective glucosylation in the ER and activation of ER stress. So there's no reason why in the knockout cells also uh, EIF2 alpha won't be phosphorylated, and, and this can explain the reduced translation independently of EDP. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean we didn't do the experiment, and I, and I and I think you're right. This is a fascinating. Uh, uh, avenue of research to continue on this. I think I, I think Gabriel, my my collaborator, he is working now on this. Mm -hmm. And also, and, and nobody asked, but I can ask, how the cells die? Yes. So yeah. we did some EM. We did a couple of experiments uh, that that we don't. It's not apoptosis, and it's not. And we don't know what other kind of cell death it might be. We don't have, like, let's say, a clear, a clear answer to this question. And this can go back to the ER stress and, and why cells die of the ER stress. I'm not sure that it's 100% resolved. So okay, so that's yeah, that that that's very very. Nice. So the other question is, if no one wants to uh, ask questions, I continue. The so the other question is. Uh, uh, what happens with autophagy, mitophagy, lipophagy? Have you, is there any, anything going on? So, so, so this is a great, uh, a great, great question, Andreas. Uh, and we thought about it because when mTOR is inhibited, then this directly activates a, a autophagy through ULK. So, uh, we measured autophagy flux by. Uh, by using, I think, chloroquine and measuring LC3-2 accumulation. And we see that there's no difference between whether you have or not 4DP, which mm -hmm. is consistent with the fact that 4DP is not known to regulate autophagy, but we had to check because it's an important survival pathway under starvation. Okay. Regarding mitophagy and the other uh, phages, we don't know. Because the li lipophagy would be also interesting to look at. Uh, yeah, I didn't think about it, but I agree now. <laughs> yeah, that that would be. Yes. I think that would be very interesting. So the other thing is now. May, may I ask? Uh, yeah. May I ask something on that? Okay. So, go uh, ahead. I, go ahead. Just to go um, with your Lucie question. Lucie Brisson, or... she is working with me in. Um, <laughs> yes. In our, nice our to meet you. Nice to meet you. Very nice presentation. Um, regarding your cell death pathway, um, have you looked at uh, ferroptosis? Because if you have, um, and maybe lipid droplet content, because if you have uh, oxidative stress, you can have also some fatty acid uh, oxidation and ferroptosis. So, so we didn't measure ferroptosis. So I don't know, but I agree with you that this is a question. And, and as I said, this is I, I my my partner is now is now really trying to figure out like what, what is the death pathway, why do they die? And so those is definitely an interesting uh, an interesting option. Yes, also due to the fact that there's increased uh, loss. I agree. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so if we turn now to the uh, glioma models that you are using, okay? Because this is the this is the is this is the question because you are you you have using cell lines. I mean, the GL two six one. You have used U eighty seven stuff like this. So <clears> I think the mo the very important thing would be to use stem cell lines. 
from patients derived stem cell lines to because they do not behave let's say exactly the same and the other thing is also that the implantation when you do subcute implantation is not the brain and the the tumor cells they do not behave exactly the same so the uh, so so i would really if i were you i would really go for this uh, for, for the stem cell lines or the patient derived stuff to to check again your data because then you will be really sure that it's it's working in in that and what would be also very very interesting to look on the difference between stem cell phenotype cells because there's you know stem cells it's a kind of fluid uh, yeah. fluid concept you know it's not just they are glioblastoma stem cells, but they are moving. Spectrum. Yeah, it's a spectrum. It's a it's a kind of spectrum. And the uh, so it would be nice, however, to look in cells that are more into the stem cell spectrum and the others that are more differentiated. So that's I think would be really very very interesting to to see. Right. I totally agree. I mean, there's there's also we can do some. I mean, we didn't do this experiment, but we can definitely check with some omics to see where which let's say in which state or which type of subtype of glioma uh, the foil P one looks more let's say more relevant, and then use these cells for for these experiments. Um, I just want to say that the the experiment uh, with the GL two six one is in the brain. But I agree that it's not it's not the human cells. It's not it's not the same thing, especially not if not like stem cells, which they grow very slow and they have they have many characteristics which are different than than this model. Yeah, of course, because the GL two six one is a kind of glioblastoma. Huh? It's a very very uh, it goes even outside of the brain. You know, sometimes oh. it's it's very weird, <laughs> but it's. Uh, it's it's uh, so it's important that I think to to do that in these type of cell lines, and the other thing is also uh, in your inducible experiment because you you block it at the beginning right of the of the of the growth right it was at the yeah. beginning it was in, so the idea would be to let it grow and then to see if you have re regression or not. Because yeah. this is this type of experiment you, I mean, either the, the prevention experiment or the re regression experiment, you know, that that I would do if, uh, or I, I mean, if, if I were you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's a good point. Maybe we didn't let them grow enough because we did let them grow before treating yes. the, the mite with uh -huh. dogs, but maybe we should have let it grow, let's say, halfway to the maximum rather than just uh, 10 or 20% to the maximum. Yeah, that that would be interesting. Also, it would be interesting to do the pathology on the on the regressing tumors. Yes, I think looks. it would be very interesting to see, for instance, yeah. what is the, what are the vessels, how they are, how they invade, and so forth. Right? I mean, if you want to have a, if you want to have help with that, we can do that. Just just send so, the tumors. We can do that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So it has no no problem. So we have uh, here the expertise in the lab. Fantastic, thank you. Okay. So uh, are there any other questions here? Because I mean, if you have questions you don't want to ask them, just use the chat, okay? And I will uh, I will ask them if they are, I think people are a little bit shy still. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the Ahmad already talked, okay. Uh, I think okay, maybe let's say uh, so a final one now. The so what you would like to use it as a therapeutic target, right? So how do you how do you want to do that? Would you do that in a molecule, a chemical, or a more <clears throat> genetic approach? So what is your your idea about it? So actually now we are uh, we have a collaboration with a company trying to develop an inhibitor and uh, and we're looking for a small molecule inhibitor. Um, so I think I think you know I mean there's a reason I, I can't really say too much about how what the strategy we take to go about it, 
but uh, we're looking for a small molecule that will inhibit the activity of phone. Right, a small molecule, the only thing is it has to go inside of the cell. And it does it. many, many things. It has to go inside the cell. For it is, a, is an unstructured target. protein, which is also exactly. doesn't make life easier. It's not and easy. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not an easy project. But uh, we have a good company, the NABN, it's National Institute of Biotechnology in the Negev. So it's a company that's on campus, and they're. Yeah, yeah, I've seen them. them. I've seen, I've seen them. I've, yeah. I was there, you know. There. So, so they they're really interested, and they have the expertise. We we have consultants and so on, and and we get funding to do these kind of experiments, and Great. we're working on it. But no, it's it's not an easy project. Not an easy project. Okay, so with this, I think we uh, we will end this. So I would like to thank you very much, Barak. It was very interesting and exciting talk. I learned a lot because I'm, I mean, even if I were uh, listening to this the second time, you know, so I have <laughs> I heard this before, but it's uh, it was really very nice. And I think people, and if there are young people in the audience, students, they should really take this as a lesson on how to uh, conduct a research project, okay? Thank so, you so much. So thank you very much. So we, we keep in contact and we can yep. talk more uh, so about it if you need any help and stuff like this with the with so with the anal with the analysis of the two most and something like that. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So so thank you, Barak, and talk to you soon. Bye bye. Ciao, bye bye.